the seventh rose, crown of roses. Ever since Blessed Alan de la Roque re-established this devotion, the voice of the people, which is the voice of God, called it the rosary. The word rosary means crown of roses. That is to say, that every time people say the rosary devoutly, they place a crown of 153 white roses and 16 red roses upon the heads of Jesus and Mary. Being heavenly flowers, these roses will never fade or lose their exquisite beauty. Our Lady has shown her thorough approval of the name Rosary. She has revealed to several people that each time they say a Hail Mary, they are giving her a beautiful rose and that each complete rosary makes her a crown of roses. The well-known Jesuit brother Alphonsus Rodriguez used to say his rosary with such fervor that he often saw a red rose come out of his mouth at each Our Father and a white rose at each Hail Mary. The red and white roses were equal in beauty and fragrance, the only difference being in their color. The Chronicles of St. Francis tell of a young friar who had the praiseworthy habit of saying the crown of Our Lady, the rosary, every day before dinner. One day, for some reason or the other, he did not manage to say it. The refectory bell had already been rung when he asked the superior to allow him to say it before coming to the table. And having obtained the permission, he withdrew to his cell to pray. After he had been gone a long time, the superior sent another friar to fetch him, and he found him in his room, bathed in a heavenly light, facing Our Lady, who had two angels with her. Beautiful roses kept issuing from his mouth at each Hail Mary. The angels took them one by one, placing them on Our Lady's head, and she smilingly accepted them. Finally, two other friars who had been sent to find out what had happened to the first two saw the same lovely scene, and Our Lady did not go away until the whole rosary had been said. So the complete rosary is a large crown of roses, and the rosary of five decades is a little wreath of flowers or a small crown of heavenly roses which we place on the heads of Jesus and Mary. The rose is the queen of flowers. And so the rosary is the rose of all devotions, and it is therefore the most important one. Eighth rose, marvels of the rosary. It would hardly be possible for me to put into words how much Our Lady thinks of the Holy Rosary and of how she vastly prefers it to all other devotions. Neither can I sufficiently express how highly she rewards those who work to preach the devotion, to establish it and spread it nor, on the other hand, how firmly she punishes those who work against it. All during life, St. Dominic had nothing more at heart than to praise Our Lady, to preach her greatness, and to inspire everybody to honor her by saying her rosary. As a reward, he received countless graces from her. Exercising her great power as Queen of Heaven, she crowned his labors with many miracles and prodigies, Almighty God always granted him what he asked through Our Lady. The greatest honor of all was that she helped him crush the Albigensian heresy and made him the founder and patriarch of a great religious order. As for Blessed Alan de la Roque, who restored the devotion to the Rosary, he received many privileges from Our Lady. She graciously appeared to him several times to teach him how to work out his salvation and to become a good priest and perfect religious, and how to pattern himself on our Lord. He used to be horribly tempted and persecuted by devils, and then deep sadness would fall upon him, and sometimes he used to be near to despair. But Our Lady always comforted him by her sweet presence, which banished the clouds of darkness from his soul. She taught him how to say the rosary, explaining its value and the fruits to be gained by it, and gave him a great and glorious privilege, the honor of being called her new spouse. As a token of her chaste love for him, she placed a ring upon his finger 
and a necklace made of her own hair about his neck and gave him a rosary. Father Tritame, Carthagena and Martin of Navarre, both very learned men, and others as well have spoken of him in terms of highest praise. Blessed Alan died at Zuno in Flanders, September 8, 1475, after having brought over 100,000 people into the confraternity. Blessed Thomas of St. John was well known for his sermons on the Most Holy Rosary, and the devil, jealous of the success he had with souls, tortured him so much that he fell ill and was sick so long that the doctors gave him up. One night when he really thought he was dying, the devil appeared to him in the most horrible form imaginable. There was a picture of Our Lady near his bed. He looked at it and cried with all his heart and soul and strength, Help me, save me, my sweet, sweet mother. No sooner had he said this than the picture seemed to come alive, and Our Lady put out her hand, took him by the arm and said, Do not be afraid, Thomas, my son. Here I am, and I am going to save you. Get up now and go on preaching my rosary as you used to do. I promise to shield you from your enemies. When Our Lady said this, the devil fled, and Blessed Thomas got up, finding that he was in perfect health. He then thanked the Blessed Mother with tears of joy. He resumed his rosary apostolate, and his sermons were marvelously successful. Our Lady blesses not only those who preach her rosary, but she highly rewards all those who get others to say it by their example. Alphonsus, King of Leon and Galicia, very much wanted all his servants to honor the Blessed Virgin by saying the rosary. So he used to hang a large rosary on his belt and always wore it, but unfortunately never said it himself. Nevertheless, his wearing it encouraged his courtiers to say the rosary very devoutly. One day, the king fell seriously ill, and when he was given up for dead, he found himself in a vision before the judgment seat of our Lord. Many devils were there accusing him of all the sins he had committed, and our Lord as sovereign judge was just about to condemn him to hell when Our Lady appeared to intercede for him. She called for the pair of scales and had his sins placed in one of the balances, whereas she put the rosary that he had always worn on the other scale, together with all the rosaries that had been said because of his example. It was found that the rosaries weighed more than his sins. Looking at him with great kindness, Our Lady said, As a reward for this little honor that you paid me in wearing my rosary, I have obtained a great grace for you from my son. Your life will be spared for a few more years, so that you see that you spend these years wisely and do penance. When the king regained consciousness, he cried out, Blessed be the rosary of the Most Holy Virgin Mary, by which I have been delivered from eternal damnation. After he had recovered his health, he spent the rest of his life in spreading devotion to the Holy Rosary and said it faithfully every day. People who love the Blessed Virgin ought to follow the example of King Alphonsus and that of the saints whom I have mentioned so that they too may win other souls for the confraternity of the Holy Rosary. They will then receive great graces on earth and eternal life later on. They that explain me shall have life everlasting. Ecclesiasticus chapter 24, verse 31. Ninth rose, enemies. It is very wicked indeed and unfair to other souls to hinder the progress of the confraternity of the Holy Rosary. Almighty God has severely punished many of those who have been so benighted as to scorn the confraternity and who have sought to destroy it. Even though God has set his seal of approval on the Holy Rosary by many miracles, and in spite of the papal bulls that have been written approving it, there are only too many people who are against the Holy Rosary today. These free thinkers and those who scorn religion either condemn the Rosary or try to turn others away from it. It is easy to see that they have absorbed the poison of hell and that they are inspired by the devil. 
For nobody can condemn devotion to the Holy Rosary without condemning all that is most holy in the Catholic faith, such as the Lord's Prayer, the angelic salutation, the mysteries of the life, death, and glory of Jesus Christ and of His Holy Mother. These freethinkers who cannot bear others to say the Rosary often fall into a really heretical state of mind without even realizing it, and some to hate the Rosary and its holy mysteries. To have a loathing for confraternities is to fall away from God and true piety. For our Lord himself has told us that he is always in the midst of those who are gathered together in his name. No good Catholic should forget the many great indulgences which Holy Mother Church has granted to confraternities. Finally, to dissuade others from joining the Rosary Confraternity is to be an enemy of souls because the Rosary is a sure means of curing oneself of sin and of embracing a Christian life. St. Bonaventure said in his Psalter that whoever neglected Our Lady would perish in his sins and would be damned. He who neglects her will die in his sins. If such is the penalty for neglecting her, what must be the punishment in store for those who actually turn others away from their devotions? Tenth Rose Miracles While St. Dominic was preaching the Rosary in Carcassonne, a heretic made fun of the miracles and the 15 mysteries of the Holy Rosary, and this prevented other heretics from being converted. As a punishment, God suffered 15,000 devils to enter the man's body. His parents took him to Father Dominic to be delivered from the evil spirits. He started to pray and begged everyone who was there to say the rosary out loud with him. And at each Hail Mary... Our Lady drove out 100 devils out of the heretic's body and they came out in the form of red-hot coals. After he had been delivered, he abjured his former errors, was converted and joined the Rosary Confraternity. Several of his associates did the same, having been greatly moved by his punishment and by the power of the Rosary. The learned Franciscan Cartagena, as well as several other authors, says that an extraordinary event took place in 1482. The Venerable James Spregner and other religious of his order were zealously working to re-establish devotion to the Holy Rosary and also to erect a confraternity in the city of Cologne. Unfortunately, two priests, who were famous for their preaching ability, were jealous of the great influence they were exerting through preaching the Rosary. So these two fathers spoke against this devotion whenever they had a chance. And as they were very eloquent and had a great reputation, they persuaded many people not to join the confraternity. One of them, bound and determined to achieve his wicked end, wrote a special sermon against the rosary and planned to give it the following Sunday. But when it came time for the sermon, he never appeared. And after a certain amount of waiting, somebody went to fetch him. He was found dead and evidently had died all alone without anyone to help him and without seeing a priest. After convincing himself that death had been due to natural causes, the other priest decided to carry out his friend's plan and to give a similar sermon on another day. In this way, he hoped to put an end to the confraternity of the rosary. However, when the day came for him to preach, and it was time to give the sermon. God punished him by striking him down with paralysis, which deprived him both of the use of his limbs and of his power of speech. At last he admitted his sin and likewise that of his friend, and immediately in his heart of hearts he silently besought Our Lady to help him. He promised her that if she would only cure him, he would preach the Holy Rosary with as much zeal as that with which he had formerly fought against it. For this end he implored her to restore his health and speech, which she did, and finding himself instantaneously cured, he rose up like another soul, a persecutor turned a defender of the Holy Rosary. He publicly acknowledged his former error and ever after preached the wonders of the Most Holy Rosary with great zeal, 
and eloquence. I'm quite sure that free thinkers and ultra critical people of today will question the truth of the stories in this little book in the very same way that they have always questioned most things. But all that I have done has been to copy them from very good contemporary writers and also in part from a book that was written only a short time ago, The Mystical Rose Tree by the Reverend Antonian Thomas O.P. Everyone knows that there are three different kinds of faith by which we believe different kinds of stories. To stories of Holy Scripture, we owe divine faith. To stories concerning other than religious subjects, which do not militate against common sense and which are written by trustworthy authors, we pay the tribute of human faith. Whereas to story about holy subjects, which are told by good authors and are not in the slightest degree contrary to reason, faith or morals, even though they may sometimes deal with happenings which are above the ordinary run of events, we pay the tribute of pious faith. I agree that we must be either too credulous nor too critical and that we should remember that virtue takes the middle course. Keeping a happy medium in all things in order to find just where truth and virtue lie. But on the other hand, I know equally well that charity easily leads us to believe all that is not contrary to faith or morals. Charity believeth all things, 1 Corinthians 13.7. In the same way, pride induces us to doubt even well-authenticated stories on the plea that they are not found in the Bible. This is one of the devil's traps. Heretics of the past who denied tradition have fallen into it, and overcritical people of today are falling into it too, without even realizing it. People of this kind refuse to believe that they do not understand or what is not to their liking simply because of their own spirit of pride and independence.